uh, racism. So the, the second core point I want to talk about is being disconnected from yourself, right, and your emotional system. Um, so, Sarah, actually, just okay. yes, I am happy to get into that. Um, so, you know, one of the ways in which we're disconnected from our emotional system is that we're taught that racism is in the past. It's not something that exists today. And I think one of the challenges of that is that there are so many ways in which racism exists today, but it's framed not as racism, but as something else, as classism, um, and as being about an individual person and their problem. And I think one of the things that's so important is how we're explicit about the way in which hate is playing out day to day. And again, you can see this in terms of um, what's happening in the NFL right now and the attacks on players of color. You can see it in terms of the work of Black Lives Matter and the movement for black lives and all of the attacks and sort of the, the focus on individuals um, and sort of every time a person of color is killed by the police, the way that there's an attempt to make excuses for why that person was killed and why they were not a good person. Okay, so instead of Wow, just listen to her speak. She is tr she's drowning in the Kool-Aid. She's not even drinking it. She's just like, her lungs are filled with it. I mean, she's like, all the attacks that people of color NFL players receive, what? What do they receive? Are, are you talking about the guy who didn't stand up during the national anthem? Yeah, that was uh, di very disrespectful, and he got his 15 minutes of fame. We've moved past that. But what other players? What other players in the NFL that are of color have had any problems? The last person I can think of is Ray Rice, who abused his partner, his fiance at the time, even though she initiated the violence. And he only hit her one time after she had, you know, hit him several times. But that, that's the only person I can think of in NFL lately who has been like... A victim of something and it wasn't because of his race it was because he was a man and, and then you're talking about people of Black Lives Matter and we only focus on the individual actions no I'm looking at the group as a whole yeah, yeah the, the burning, burning cities, cities to the, to the ground, ground the, the rioting the looting or that what happened just in Charlotte a few nights ago where they stop truck they stopped traffic on a freeway then went into trucks pulled the stuff out and set it on fire. What the fuck is that? Oh, these are just individuals. They don't represent Black Lives Matter. You know, funny enough, they would probably say the same thing about you. That you don't represent Black Lives Matter, and they do. Or how about the protests, like, uh, what do we want? Dead cops! You know, they're, they're screaming for cops to be killed and then making excuses for why people are shot by the cops. Well, it's not excuses, it's the facts. I mean, if you're stopped by a cop, you know what you don't do? You don't run away. You know what you don't do? You don't pull out a gun. You do what you're told. Now, is, are there incidences, w instances where black people are killed after doing everything they're told. Yes. And those need to be dealt with. And in those cases, I really dislike when police are given a slap on the wrist. I do hate that they're automatically assumed to be innocent of their crime, even when they have evidence that supports the contrary. I do hate that, but for the most part, police are justified in their actions. And if you start waving a gun in the air, even if your hands are up, better guess what? You're going to get shot. And more white people die at the hands of police than black people. Mm -hmm. A lot more. But because whiteness is normalized, we don't focus on that. I mean, making excuses for this to happen... We don't need to make excuses. We're given the facts. You just want to ignore the facts and focus on their skin color. Well, look, here's news to you. 
If you focus on their skin color and not by the actions of what they have done to cause this situation to occur, you're fucking racist. Because all you see is color. I don't see color. I see a man who did something stupid. I see a man who didn't listen when he was giving instructions. The female cop that shot the man, I think she should be prosecuted. I think the, the book should be thrown at her. Because I really believe she did something wrong. The man had surrendered and she still shot him. But I'm waiting for feminists to make an excuse for her. That somehow it wasn't that bad even though it was a black man. Or throw her under the bus. Well, she's not really a woman. It's like I, I keep seeing these articles about how women, women shouldn't, shouldn't be sentenced, sentenced to prison, prison time, time because vagina. vagina. It's, it's like, like, okay, but what happens when they, they don't, don't buy into your narrative, narrative and they break the law? Then are they suddenly, can, can they be put, put in prison then? Well, women are never responsible for their actions. If a woman does anything violent, it was because a man provoked her. So I think one of the things that's really important for us as white people is that to recognize that we're taught that people of color deserve what happened to them, as opposed to it being a system that sets people up to be murdered, to be um, hurt, um, for women of color to be targeted for abuse, particularly sexual abuse. There's an amazing book about this called The Dark End of the Street, which is about how the history of the black liberation movement was in um, women of color, primarily black women, organizing against sexual assaults that were happening throughout the South. So I would encourage folks to check that out. Um, we're taught that what's racist is not racist um, because, again, by naming it and not and refusing to be colorblind, um, that by naming racism, that that makes it uh, racist. And I really want to put this under this point of the pain of disconnection because what that means is we're living a lie every day as white people because we're living this lie that what we know to be true, for children to be shot, for people to be abused, for people to be arrested, for there to be genocide, for um, hundreds of thousands of um, black people to be enslaved and brought to this country, was not actually abuse of power. And so we have to just feel that. And I would even encourage people right now to take a minute and put your hand on your heart and just take a deep breath and feel that pain. <sighs> I feel the pain of having to watch this. You're saying that genocide is not an abuse of power? So when uh, Somali warlords were trying to commit uh, genocide on the population, that wasn't an abuse of power? When Africans sold slaves to Europeans, that wasn't an abuse of power? That was systemic racism by white people? That it's commonplace that if we give it a name, it's no longer racism. Mm -hmm. It's, it's like, like they change, they try to change the definition of racism. racism. It's like prejudice, prejudice plus, plus power. It's like, no, if you make a disparaging remark about someone based on their race, you're, you're a racist. racist. In, end of definition, end, end of discussion. discussion. You're, you're a racist. racist. I wouldn't say necessarily that they're racist, but they made a racist remark. You know, I, I make jokes, racial jokes all the time. And my black friends make racial jokes about white people. I mean, me and uh, Prentice Reed, we're, we're cracking up on our show that no one gets to hear. Because, you know, we were talking about racial um, slurs, and he was talking about the word cracker. And he's like, you know, every time I hear the word cracker, it makes me want to eat a cracker. And I'm like, oh, I'd like some cr a cracker with some grape soda. He's like, dude, that's racist. You know, we're just back and forth with each other. But you know what? Does that necessarily make me racist for saying something racist? No. It was racist that I said it, though. That wouldn't actually be a disparaging remark, because a disparaging remark is... It is negative, negative in, in its, its form. form. It is meant to be negative. It's, it's not. not. 
it's not a joke between friends. It's this is specifically meant to harm you on an emotional level. Like uh, Basfar Mustafa, when she was saying, uh, well, you know, what I said about kill all white men was not racist because racist implies power and white people have power so you can't be racist towards them. And adding that element of power, that's not in the definition of racism at all. That's some progressive bullshit that was just added so they could move the goalpost and continue to be right in their mind. And I want to add to that, that part of what makes it hard for us to be connected to our emotional system is that our society doesn't want us to be connected to our emotional system. Systemic oppression doesn't want us to actually feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because if it does, then we're going to be moved to want to do something about the violence that's happening around us. Right, right. you know, when we talk about patriarchy and how it it has, you know, men shouldn't have feelings. Well, there's a reason why, you know, there's a reason why patriarchy sets that up, and that's part of being a man, right? The only feelings that men apparently are allowed by patriarchy is, is anger, right? There's a reason why they don't want us to have feelings, because it will actually make us stop participating in systemic oppression, right? Yes, exactly. Um, people were asking again for the name of the book that I mentioned. It was called The Dark End of the Street. Um, and I don't remember the author's name, but we can look that up and send it out in the follow-up email or in some, I'll put it in the, the question and answer in a few minutes. We talked about the jump cut earlier before. Maybe the first stream might have been live, but I think they just um, edited it and put it on for other streams. So those streams weren't live. It was only live the first time. I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt of that's what they did. Because that would make sense. So, I know. So, not every... The, only the first time was it live. Every other time, it wasn't. So, you can't really claim it to be live on the same day. Unless they were giving it over and over again. But well, that begs the question. Why, why was there a need for a jump cut? I mean, if you're just going to record something, have it live the first time, and then put it out over and over again, why do you need a jump cut? It's a very good point. Makes me wonder. Uh, I wish I was there for the original broadcasting. I wish I was there for that. But I really, well, I have a life first and foremost, and I can't just sit there and spend like few hours waiting for something to happen because nothing ever happens on time and then watching this drivel and looking at the chat so I think another thing that I just wanted to say about um, the disconnection from ourselves and our emotional systems as white people is that we lose our ability to feel compassion in the face of the pain of people of color Um, we lose our ability to even entertain the possibility that we might have some implicit bias. And we blame individual people and and victims or survivors for what it is that happened to them. So as we become more racially conscious, we realize that um, we've bought into this lie. In certain ways, it's sort of like the matrix. We've bought into this way that the world is. And so part of the challenge for ourselves is to recognize the lie that's there um, or the dream. Um, as Coates referred to in his book, um, Between the World and I. Um, There's a challenge for a lot of white people who can get overwhelmed with guilt and shame when they realize the ways in which they've bought into this narrative. And one of the things that we really encourage is for folks not to get caught up in that guilt and shame, but to focus instead on what is it that we've also lost as white people because of disconnecting from our emotional system. And these are some of the practices that we'll be teaching in the eight-week course is what are practices to start to reconnect to our emotional system and to feel all of the feelings um, and not let our fear of making mistakes, which I know is a big concern that a lot of people are talking about in the chat and in the pre-survey, not let our fear of making mistakes keep us from being brave. We all really need to practice bravery in an ongoing way as white people challenging racism and committed to dismantling white supremacy. Um, 
and to, to learn to address our fear of exploring what it means to restore justice to people of color, what that would look like in terms of reparations around housing and education and in so many different ways. And that's going to be an ongoing challenge, but to also look at our fear of the ways that the implicit biases that we still have may still be causing harm. And that's just an ongoing process as we become more racially conscious. Because mm -hmm. what we have all been taught is actually how to harm people, right? Mm -hmm. and, and unless we can, and so we're going to do it, <laughs> right? Yeah. That, is, that is the thing that people need to understand, that we, we make mistakes. The question is, the question is not how can I never make a mistake, but the question is like, what am I going to do when I do make a mistake? Yeah. Are you going to deny that it happened? Deny the harm that could cause? Or are you like, oh, I messed up, right? And then sit with the pain of knowing that you've hurt somebody and then be with the person that you've hurt, right? And see what you can do to make amends, right? Because this is going to happen rather than not, you know, not to say, you know, we're not even talking about always like racism, around sexism, around romantic relationships and friendships with family, ish, at work. This is, this is just humans. We're humans. We're not perfect, right? I personally feel that you have wronged me by labeling all men as rapists and all white people of being white supremacists. And I want you to denounce feminism and everything to make amends and reparations for the harm you've caused me. And, and, the, like, and the like three hours that we've spent been listening to your shit. Are you going to do that? No. Even though you tell people that's what they should do, you're not going to do it. And no, I'm being serious. You know, I don't like hearing that all men are rapists and need to be taught not to rape when not even 1% of male society are rapists. Not even 1% of 1% or 1% of 1% of 1% are rapists. The amount of rapists out there are such a vast minority and yet all men must carry the burden of it. And women don't carry the burden at all even when they do commit rape. Whether it's against women, against men, against children, they do not carry the burden at all. They're given a slap on the wrist. But men, we must carry the burden for everyone. And for white people, we must carry not only the burden for all white people everywhere in the world, but for the past. We must carry this burden. And this is the things that I hear out of feminism every single day. Oh, I guess that's why it's called everyday feminism. Because it's the same drivel day in and day out. And this is why I fight the way I do. This is why I do all of this shit. Because I want to get rid of people like you. And I'm sure you're going to twist that around into racism, but it has nothing to do with the fact that you're Asian. It has everything to do with you being a vicious person. I don't care what's between your legs. I don't care about your genetics. I care about you, and I want you to not exist. Batman said it best. It's not who I am that matters. It's what I do. But yes, what Batman said, and... You know, that was also a point that I made on my um, YouTube video about uh, Black Lives Matter. You know, I actually played the clip, you know, it's not what I do, but it's not who I am. It matters. It's what I do that defines me. It's not who I am underneath, but what I do, yeah. So, yeah, that's exactly it. And what you do, what everyday feminism does is it constantly keeps putting the blame on someone else rather than take responsibility for yourself. And keeps telling everyone else to do the same thing. And you know what? I think that the only reason why they come after white people is because white people are a vast minority. It's like, what, 65% of the U.S. right now is white? It's an easy target because largely white people don't fight back. They don't go, oh no, well, this, this happened and people will just stay quiet and kind of lower their head and it's like, just avoid conflict, and it'll go away. Especially the Jews. No, that's not an anti-Semitic joke. I'm being actually serious that, for the most part, the Jews have lived their lives trying to turn the other cheek. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's the fear of causing, the fear that comes from not being able to be with your own pain that actually drives more harmful action because you can't change. You can't right. stop it because you're not even naming that it's harmful, right? And I know for a lot of people, one of the things that's coming up in the Q&A is around the guilt that white people have and how much space that can take up in activist spaces or in organizing spaces. And we just really want to encourage people that bringing that, working through your guilt and shame is something to do with a couple of close friends and to have some place to work through that. I think the goal for us is really around how do we create a positive white identity that can replace white supremacist practices. So how can we end the practice of white supremacy and bring in a new practice that's around a positive white identity? Right now, we know a lot of folks get really caught in guilt and shame. They feel like they're talking too much, they're taking up too much space. And one of the real challenges, one of the things that that we really aspire for people to do is to process that with a couple of people, but not to take up particularly the time and space of people of color while you're processing that guilt and shame. Because they have to deal with their experiences every day. And so for all of us who are white, it's really a question of who are a couple of close white people that I can work through this with if I have questions, if I have challenges, or, you know, through this course, that this will be a place for us to work through some of those feelings of guilt and shame and to get support for that, but that it's not something that you want to bring into every organizing space because it can take away from the work that you all are there to do. So let me get this straight. You want to basically, for white people, to denounce their whiteness, to embrace what other people tell them to do, people of color, but you don't want them to talk to people of color about it. You want them to talk to other white people about it. Well, first off, that's segregation, saying that only white people can talk to white people. That's what you're saying right there. And two, the people that they should be making amends to, they shouldn't talk to about it, even though earlier you said that when you hurt someone's feelings, even if you didn't mean to, you need to take special time with that person and find out ways you can make it up to them, any sort of reparations to give to them to make up for what you've done to them. How are you supposed to do that if you're not allowed to talk to a person of color about the bad things that you've done, if you can only talk to other white people about it. Does a special messenger pigeon come to you and like, oh, the black people have told us that we can give them lots and lots of money and maybe they'll forgive us, but we're still not allowed to talk to them. Yeah, it's just constantly keep separate groups and keep othering each other. And that just leads to more problems. Creating separate groups makes group mentality, and then group mentality becomes mob mentality. No one benefits from mob mentality. A.K.A. Black Lives Matter. That is a mob mentality. Whatever their initial intentions were, they are a mob now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the feelings that are coming up, they're real, they're valid, they're legitimate, and they're not necessarily appropriate to be process through in cross-racial spaces focusing on racial justice. Right. Right. It's appropriate to process them in a different type of space, as, we, as Dara was saying, but just not that type of space, right? Yeah, yeah. So the third, the third um, core pain is, or rather the fear of, the fear of being disconnected from other white people as you start to engage in more anti-racism work. Yes. Um, so the fear of disconnecting, um, some of the, the conditioning that we get around this is being taught, again, that white people are the norm and deserve to be centered. And I think one of the things that really can trip folks up sometimes is that it feels like organizing with other white people for racial justice is recentering whiteness. And I think one of the things that we think is really important is that white supremacy is what's centering whiteness. It's not white people fighting racism. So by fighting racism, that's actually the process of decentering whiteness, particularly if you're doing that with other white people, because it really is about trying to create a different space to do that. Let me get this straight. The problem you have with whiteness or white supremacy is that a bunch of white people got together and made a decision about how to treat other people. And what you're wanting now is a bunch of white people to get together to decide on how to treat white people. 
Aren't you instead creating the exact same system that you're supposedly fighting against? It's just a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's just another way that they can keep complaining. Yeah. You're basically talking about creating white supremacy all over again. And I don't think... The only white supremacy that I recognize is like the KKK, who went through extreme measures to try to control the population. You know, and yes, once upon a time, people were a lot more racist in this country, but that is a far cry from what we see today. Yeah, the the KKK has a number of like, like 5,000 members in the entire United States of America, and that's like the... What's that uh, law, law center, center that, that does uh, uh, the does reports, reports about hate groups, the Southern Poverty Law, or some some, some shit, shit like that. that? Like they even have the number of actual Ku Klux Klan members, and it's, it's like, like no, no more, more than five thousand in the entire country. country. The KKK has no real power. It, it's not like back in the thirties and forties. When they did have power. And even then, they were an organization, Sa Southern Poverty Law Center. Southern Poverty Law, yeah. I mean, even back then, they relied more on cloak and dagger type involvement. They weren't directly involved. Yes, there are a lot of powerful people within that, but not today. I mean, yes, there might be some powerful people that are in the, that kind of group, but they would be the vast minority. And they would be very quiet about the things, things that they're, they're doing. And I'm not going around saying, oh yeah, I'm a member of this group that hates people, and I have a bunch of power. They're, they're going to be quiet about it. And yet, you say that this still exists today, that it's very prevalent, and all of the actions that we do as white people is detrimental to people of color. And what we need to do is recognize that we're doing this, work to undo it by talking to other white people. Once again, creating white supremacy. That's exactly what you're doing. You're saying the people of power need to decide everything once again. This time in the way that we want them to. You're not even saying, you know what, you need to step aside and let us take care of it. It's like you're being the perpetual submissive in this situation. Well, the, the, the weird, weird thing, thing is, is, earlier on in the video, she said that if, if people, people handle, handle their, their own issues, it works a lot better. She, she actually, actually stated that, that, that people need to step, step up and, and handle their, their own issues. issues. If you clean your own house... It, it makes, makes the world, world a better, better place. place. She said those exact words. Well, well, how can you say clean your own house and then this other group has to take care of fixing everything. They have to enact the hard labor of fixing everything for everybody right after saying clean your own house. Make your own life better. Do you think that the... Um colonists went to Britain and said well you need to fix you need to clean your own house you need to fix our problems no they revolted and created their own country the country you currently live in you know if you truly feel that the world needs to change that you need to be the leader of that movement to change it or find someone who you know agrees with most of the things you do and make them the leader but not ask other people that they have to do it instead, and you sit back and get all the glory. As it feels like you, there, there's the uh, moment in X Men uh, Last Stand, one of the few moments that I like. I pretty much hate that movie, but there's the scene where they come onto the prison island or whatever, and Magneto tells Juggernaut to stand back. Is like there's a reason why pawns go first. And that's why I feel like they're doing. They're trying to get white people to become pawns. To take all of the heavy lifting that needs to be done. So the feminists and Black Lives Matter can come in and say, Okay, we did everything. 
Even though it was white people who did all the work. We did this. If you look at feminism, you see this a lot. I call it the mobile bulletproof wall. It's like, you look, you look at feminism and how they're championing the LGBT community. Well, they're basically using them as something to catch all of the shit and help them help themselves move forward. They're not actually benefiting the LGBT community. They're just using them as the ram to knock down what they perceive as in their way. It's the same tactics, just with different groups. Then they're using each group against each other, and the only one that's gaining from it is feminism. 